Hello everyone. I welcome you all to this 19th lecture of this course. This 19th lecture is on in vitro methods to study the antibacterial and anti-cancer properties of nanomaterials. So in this lecture, we are going to learn uh, various in vitro methods to study the antibacterial and anti-cancer properties of nanomaterials. First, we will study about uh, what are the various methods available to study the antibacterial properties of nanomaterials. So the first experiment is uh, turbidity assay. Okay. So in this, uh, we are going to visually monitor the turbidity of the bacterial growth. Okay. And whenever you make a nanoparticles, the first thing is you have to select the suitable bacteria to study the antibacterial efficiency. So the ideal choice should be like uh, 1 gram positive bacteria and 1 gram negative bacteria. So in this experiment, we have selected Staphylococcus aureus, SREs okay, as a gram positive model and uh, E. coli as a gram negative model. And we have treated with the different concentration of copper, zinc, nanofibers. Okay. So here you will be taking an equal amount of bacteria in the test tube and you will be adding different concentration of your nanomaterials to study the antibacterial efficiency of your nanomaterials. And in the uh, control that is where there is no nanomaterial, you can see here the growth of bacteria is visible by the turbidity. Okay. And with respect to concentration, you can see here the turbidity is going down. So using this uh, visual turbidity assay, we can easily identify the uh, minimal inhibitory concentration as well as minimal killing concentration or minimal bactericidal concentration. So I will explain you how to determine the minimal inhibitory concentration and minimal killing concentration or minimal bactericidal concentration. So for this, you will be selecting a 1 gram positive bacteria okay, and gram negative bacteria. So when we add these nanoparticles to this gram positive bacteria and gram negative bacteria, we can identify whether your nanomaterial is having antibacterial efficiency against the gram positive as well as gram negative, whether it is having a broad antibacterial efficiency or not. Okay. So here we have taken gram positive bacteria SREs and uh, gram negative bacteria E. coli. So for uh, identifying this MAC concentration, so what we have to do is we have to add equal concentration of bacteria to the test tube with the neutrine broth or the LB broth. Okay. So we can add 10 power 7 CFU that is colony forming unit. Okay. So we are adding equal concentration of bacteria to various test tubes and you will be adding different concentration of your nanoparticles. So this first one is your control where there is no nanoparticles and here for example you are adding 1 microgram and here you are adding 2 microgram, 3 microgram, okay, 4 and 5 microgram. So after that you will be incubating for 12 hours, okay, that is overnight incubation. So after incubating, you will see complete turbidity in the control where there is no nanoparticle and you will be able to see that uh, the turbidity will going down with respect to concentration. Okay. So here at some concentration, you won't see any bacterial growth. Okay. So if you are not seeing any bacterial growth at this concentration, so that is your MAC or MKC. So how do you confirm that it is MAC or MBC? So from this test tube, you have to inoculate into a fresh test tube. Okay. So from the test tube where you do not see any growth, from there you will take the inoculum and add it to the fresh tube and you incubate for 12 hours. And after 12 hours, if you are able to see the growth, that means this constant is called as minimal inhibitory concentration okay and from this test tube again you can inoculate into the fresh test tube and here there is no growth that means this concentration is called as minimal bactericidal concentration okay so you are inoculating a equal amount of bacteria and you are adding different concentration of nanomaterials okay and uh, 
the test tube where you don't find any growth from there you are taking this inoculum and adding to the fresh tube with the medium okay so if you are able to see the growth that concentration is called as inhibitory concentration so from the another test tube where there is no growth you are inoculating to the fresh tube and if you are seeing there is no growth that means this concentration is called as minimal bactericidal concentration and uh, this minimal inhibitory concentration and minimal bactericidal concentration can be also studied by optical density measurement that is called as OD okay. So whenever you estimate the DNA or protein we will be mentioning that observance at 260 or observance at 280 nanometer because your DNA or protein is observing but whenever you use that bacteria we are using the term OD that is optical density because here it is not observing it is scattering the light okay that is the difference between observance and optical density. So here this is a SRS bacteria untreated SRS bacteria and it is treated with a different concentration of uh, nano materials. So in this case it is AG Zeno nano composite okay. So you can see here with respect to concentration the bacterial growth is going down and uh, this is for uh, gram positive bacteria and this is for the gram negative bacteria E. coli. So you can see here this uh, minimal uh, inhibitory concentration as well as the minimal bactericidal concentration is different for both the bacteria. So as I told you like uh, depends on the bacteria whether it is gram positive or gram negative the antibacterial concentration will vary again similarly it depends on the bacterial strains also the antibacterial concentration and efficiency will vary okay. So in this example you can see here so 60 microgram is your uh, MAC concentration for uh, gram positive bacteria and 70 microgram is the MBC that is minimum bacterial cidal concentration and in case of E. coli it is 550 microgram as MAC and 600 microgram as a MBC value okay and here we are mentioning this n equal to 3 that means this experiment is repeated for 3 times okay 3 independent experiments then you will get the this kind of uh, bar chart okay. So you will plot the average of the value and also you will plot the this kind of standard deviation error bar. So here we have done uh, with the different concentration of nanomaterials so in the next slide you can see here so this is uh, with the respect to time point different time points okay so effect of various constant nanoparticle with respect to at different time points. So here you can see here so in the control where there is no nano material so the growth is gradually increasing and uh, in this low nano particle preparation we have used a sodium borohydrate as a reducing agent. So the reducing agent is not toxic you can see here where we added a reducing agent there is no inhibition of growth it is also growing similar to the control and uh, you can see the, this one this one is a low concentration of silicon nanoparticle that is 5.66 you can see here in presence of low concentration of silicon nanoparticle so the growth is gradually decreased okay and uh, here when we use the MAC or MKC concentration you can see that there is no growth the growth is completely inhibited or arrested. So in our experiment we have used uh, green fluorescent protein expressing E. coli okay so the advantage of using this green fluorescent protein expressing E. coli is uh, when you use the wild type bacteria. So to monitor the effect of this nanomaterials you have to stain the bacteria using gram stain. So when you do the gram stain here, there is a lot of washing steps. So there is a chance for artifacts or false positive or false negative results. So to avoid that we can use this uh, green fluorescent protein expressing E. coli. So here you can easily monitor the uh, control versus silicon nanoparticle treated E. coli. You can see here, here the morphology is uh, normal and in the treated one the morphology is the cell is damaged okay. And here we can also do that time dependent studies. So at 0 hour you can see here control and uh, silicon nanoparticle different concentration you can see here uniform amount of bacteria. So with respect to time so in control where there is no nano materials the growth is gradually increased but uh, where there is a uh, nano particles the growth is inhibited okay. And the another advantage of using this uh, GFP E. coli is we can also uh, estimate the uh, fluorescent intensity okay. So it is another way to confirm the antibacterial efficiency. You can see here with respect to different concentration nano particle the fluorescent intensity is also going down. So as I told you that every experiment you have to repeat for 3 to 5 times and you will get the average then you have to make the standard deviation error bar okay. So and uh, this is this stars on the top of this is a statistical analysis okay. So if you have more stars that means your data is more statistically significant okay a simple term to understand. And here you can see here so this control one the bacteria is more and with respect to concentration of nanoparticles the bacteria number is going down. So the next method is antibacterial assay with the disc diffusion method okay. So here uh, in the uh, bacterial plate 
So, we will be adding the lawn off bacteria by spread plate method. Okay. So, once you made a lawn off bacteria, then you will be adding this uniform size of nanofiber disc or you can uh, if you are having a nanoparticle solution, you can uh, make a sterile uh, a Wattman paper okay, uniform size and you can dip it into the nanoparticle solution and you can place it on the top of the bacterial plate where there is a lawn of bacteria and allow it to uh, stay for overnight incubation. Okay. So, after overnight incubation you can see the clear zone of incubation that means this uh, nanofiber or the nanoparticle loaded uh, disc it is inhibiting the growth of the bacteria. So, this is called as zone of inhibition. So, by measuring the length of the uh, zone of inhibition we can calculate the antibacterial efficiency of your nano material. And we can another method is colony counting method. So, it is uh, the same thing like where you did the visual turbidity method from there you can inoculate into the bacterial plate. Okay. So, you can by spread plating technique you can spread that bacterial solution on the top of this plate and here you will be incubating the plate for overnight then you can count the number of colonies. You can see here with respect to concentration the bacterial colony is going down. So, this is your control where there is a huge number of colonies okay, lawn of bacteria and with the increasing the concentration of nanoparticles the number of bacterial colony is going down. So, you can easily count that bacterial colony and you can plot it and we can also observe the morphology of the treated bacteria by using scanning ultra microscope. You can see here in the control untreated the bacteria is having normal morphology rod shape E. coli okay. and in case of treated one you can see here uh, the complete morphology is damaged the E. coli is damaged and it shows confirms that the depth of the bacteria. Okay. So, the next one is we can also use this transmission electron microscope to understand the bacterial cell death mechanism. So, you can see here this is a single bacterial cell and this is an expanded view of the bacterial cell and you can see here your cellular nanoparticles this black color spots are cellular nanoparticles. The cellular nanoparticles binding to the cell wall and it is damaging the cell wall of the bacteria and killing the bacteria. So, based on the literature, so this is a possible antibacterial mechanism. So, most of the metal nanoparticles will be having positive charge and negative charge and uh, our cell bacterial cell is having negative charge. So, this positively charged nanoparticle will come and bind through electrostatic interaction okay, and it will induce reactive oxygen species. So, and uh, again some of the nanoparticles will go inside the bacteria and bind to the DNA and that will inhibit the DNA replication as well as the inhibit the protein synthesis. And finally, it will damage the cell wall okay, and all it will all the materials will be oozing out from the damaged cell. Okay. So, these are the various uh, mechanisms nanoparticles will follow to kill the bacteria. So, let us see what are the various methods available to study the anti cancer properties of nano materials. So, before we study the anti cancer uh, properties of nano materials we have to understand two types of cell death apoptosis and necrosis. So, apoptosis is a normal or programmed cell death is a physiological process and necrosis is a accidental cell death is a pathological process. So, apoptosis is similar to a uh, normal death of a person and the uh, necrosis is similar to the accidental death of a person. So, let us see the difference between apoptosis and necrosis. So, in apoptosis membrane blebbing will occur and there will not be any loss of integrity and uh, it begins with shrinking of cytoplasm and condensation of nucleus and it ends with fragmentation of cells into smaller bodies and uh, non-random mono and oligonucleosomal length fragmentation of DNA will happen in this apoptosis and in necrosis there will be loss of membrane integrity and it begins with swelling of cytoplasm and mitochondria and ends with total lysis. Okay. And here there will be random digestion of DNA, you will find smear of DNA in the gel electrophoresis. So, let us see this in detail. Okay. So, this is your viable cell. So, during apoptosis what will happen? The cell will shrink and the chromatin will condense, okay. it forms a budding and uh, this apoptotic body will be formed okay. that will be phagocytosized. So, there will not be any inflammation, but in case of necrosis cell will be swelling and cell becomes leaky and blebbing. So, all the mitochondria and these things will be released and it will cause inflammation. The cellular and nucleolysis will leads to inflammation. So, a simple example is like if you want to break a wall you can use a simple hammer and break the wall and you can reuse the bricks to build the new wall. It is similar to your apoptosis. In case of necrosis for breaking the wall as if you are using your bomb blast okay, and you are completely destroying the particular environment as well as the wall. Okay. 
So it is a simple example to understand the apoptosis and necrosis. So let us see what are the various uh, methodologies available to study the apoptotic cells. So we will see uh, all these methodologies in detail one by one. The first one is uh, simple dye based cell viability assay. Okay. So it will not tell you whether the cell is uh, following apoptosis or necrosis, but it will tell you the number of viable cells and number of dead cells. So here we will be using this dye called tripan blue. Okay. So this tripan blue dye will stain only the dead cells. So the viable cells will not uptake this dye, okay. it will exclude this dye. So that is why this method is also called as dye exclusion method. So only the dead cells where the cell membrane integrity is lost. Okay, so the dead cells will uptake this dye and it will the dead cells will appear like a blue color. So we can easily count the blue color cells and we can calculate the number of dead cells. So when you treat the cells with the different concentration of nanoparticles and add this type and blue stain and you can count the number of dead cells. Okay. So these cell lines can be obtained from NCCS Pune, National Center for Cell Science Pune. Okay. So the next method is MTT assay or cell viability assay. So here we will be using that MTT solution okay. and this MTT usually it will be a yellow color and uh, in presence of mitochondrial dehydrogenase enzyme this will convert this yellow color into formosan crystals that is a purple color. Okay. If you have more cells viable so you will have more color. Okay. So with respect to concentration you can easily monitor the uh, cell viability and this can be measured using this microplate reader. And using that, we can plot the cell viability. Okay, so here in control, it's uh, there is no nanoparticle, and uh, with respect to different concentration of nanomaterials, the cell growth is going down. Okay, and uh, we can use the uh, different cell lines like BHK21 and HG29 cell lines. So with respect to cell lines, and uh, the anti-cancer or the toxicity effect will be varied. Okay, so let us see how we can calculate the IC50 concentration. So by using this uh, MTTSA, we can calculate the IC50 concentration that is similar to your MAC MKC only. So IC50 means the concentration required to inhibit the 50 percentage growth of cells. So in the MTT, you will be measuring this uh, cell viability percentage so by using this observance of your uh, treated sample by observance of your control that is untreated sample multiply by 100 so this will give you the cell viability percentage and how to calculate the IC50. So when you plot this MTT cell viability assay, okay, the first one is your control that is your like a hundred percentage, okay, control is untreated, okay, and you are using a different concentration of nanoparticles, so it is inhibiting like this. So this is your uh, 80 percentage and this is your 50 percentage and this is your 30 percentage. Okay. So IC50 as I told you the concentration required to inhibit the 50 percent of the growth. So you can just you can check it whether it is matching or not. So at which concentration it is inhibiting 50 percent of the growth. So for example this is your uh, control untreated and here you are using 1 microgram and this is your 2 microgram and this is your 3 microgram. That means this 2 microgram is your IC50 concentration because you can see here if you draw a line it is exactly matching with the 50 percentage. So this 2 microgram is your IC50 concentration for inhibiting the growth of particular cell type. Okay. And as I told you we have to repeat all the experiments at least 3 to 5 times and you take the average of that and plot the graph and you have to plot the standard deviation error bar. This is your error bar okay. and uh, you have to do the statistical analysis. So if you are having more, by statistical analysis we will get this kind of stars. Okay. So if you are having more stars that means the data is more statistically significant. The error rate will be less and the reproducibility will be more. Okay. 
And in this example, you can see here we have used a lung cancer cell line as well as the breast cancer cell line. A549 is the lung cancer and this MCF7 is your breast cancer cell line. And we have used this anti cancer drug niclosamide and this is a not a water soluble drug. So, when you add it to this, it is not taken up by the cells, okay. So, there is no cell death. But when you put this uh, anti cancer drug into this albumin nanoparticles, so these nanoparticles are taken up by the cells and it is inducing the anti cancer effect, okay. You can see here, so where there is a BSA nanoparticles with the nucleosamine loaded drug, you can see here the growth of the cells are going down. And uh, using that, we can calculate the IC50 concentration. Here you can see here this IC50 is 5 micromolar, okay. And in this another cells, this IC50 is approximately 2.6 micromolar, okay. So, it depends on the cell type, even though you are using the same kind of nanoparticles loaded with the same anti cancer drug, and depends on the cell type, you can see here different IC50 value you are getting, okay. So, that is why whenever you make any nano carrier or nano material, you have to study the toxicity of nanoparticles on various cell lines, okay. So, another simple experiment to understand whether your nanoparticle is inducing apoptosis or necrosis. So, we can use this acridine orange and ethereum bromide that is AOEB staining method. So, here in this acridine orange is a fluorescent DNA intercutting dye and it is permeable to all cell nuclei and it will give green color fluorescence. And this ethereum bromide is a red color, okay. So, this is a fluorescent DNA intercutting dye and it will enter only the membrane compromised nucleus to emit orange red fluorescence. So, you can see here, so the live cells will give a normal green color fluorescence and in the case of early apoptosis, what will happen? So, due to this uh, chromatin condensation, there will be a bright green fluorescence, okay. And in case of late apoptosis, the combination of red and green will get the orange color and in case of necrosis, so there won't be any nuclear condensation, only the membrane will be damaged, so it will be getting a red color nucleus, okay. So, that is your necrotic cells. So, here you can see here this is your control. So, completely uh, green color and uh, in the treated one you can see here due to nuclear condensation you can see here the bright green color spot that is your early apoptotic cells and uh, in case of late apoptotic you can see here orange color that is due to that membrane perforation as well as the nuclear membrane perforation and uh, the combination of green plus red color you are seeing this orange color this is a late apoptotic cells. And the next method is uh, how chest and rhodamine staining, okay. So, using this stain, the advantage is we can do the live cell monitoring, okay. And here, this how chest stain, this is a membrane permeable nucleus stain. So, that will give blue color fluorescence when it binds to the double standard DNA, okay. This is a nucleus stain and it is used to differentiate condensed pycnotic nuclei, okay. That is nuclei with condensed chromatin from the normal nuclei. And again, we can use this rhodamine, okay. So, the rhodamine is a membrane permeable dye that stains the mitochondria and cytoplasmic compartments. So, the rhodamine will be uh, staining the cytoplasm and it will give us orange color fluorescence and this hochet is a blue color stain, okay, that will stain the nucleus. So, using this we can do the time dependent study. So, you can see here this is untreated one, okay, and these are the treated with the different concentration of nanomaterials uh, and we can see here at different time part at 6 hour time point, 12 hour and 24 hour. So, at different time points, we can study the effect of our nanoparticles. And here this white arrows indicate the chromatin condensation and this yellow arrow point towards the cytoskeleton compaction, okay. So, you can easily monitor the uh, nuclear condensation as well as the cytoplasmic constriction using this uh, hoches and rhodamine staining. And uh, here another advantage is we can do the time dependent study, okay. And we can also examine the morphology of your uh, untreated and treated cells by using this scanning ultra microscopy, okay. So, this MCF7 is your uh, breast cancer cell line and AF51 is, is a lung cancer cell line. So, these are untreated. So, this untreated cells is having a spindle shaped cells, okay. It is well attached to the your cell culture dish, okay. And it has an intact membrane morphology. But here, the IC50 concentration treated cells, the cells are shrunk, okay, and it become rounder in shape and these are loosely attached and these are called as membrane blebbing, okay. So, which are the hallmarks of the apoptotic cell death. So, when the cells are uh, alive, what will happen? It attached to the plastic surface very tightly, okay, and it will have a spindle shape. 
So, when the cells die what happens it will detach from this uh, cell culture dish and it will become rounded cells and there will be formation of apoptotic membrane blubbing on the top of the cells. Okay. So, those things can be easily monitored using this scanning ultra microscope. And we can also use this atomic force microscope to understand the cellular morphology. So, this is your control you can see here this is your uh, uh, like a long fibroblast cells and this is your nucleus. So, in the untreated the cell morphology is perfect, but in the treated one you can see here. So, the cells are undergoing early stage of apoptosis you can see here that membrane blubbing is started forming okay. and these are the late apoptotic cells the cells become rounded. Okay. And we can also use this atomic force microscope to study the surface roughness of the control versus treated cells. So, in the control cells you can see here there is a smooth surface and uh, whereas, in treated cells you can see here the roughness is also changed. So, by measuring the roughness also we can understand whether the uh, what is the status of the cell membrane and everything. So, the next method is cellular DNA fragmentation ELISA. So, here we will be incubating the cells with uh, BRDU that is bromodeoxyuridine. Okay. So, this uracil will be incorporated into your uh, DNA. Okay. So, this BRDU will be incorporated into your DNA and when you treat with the nanoparticles, so there will be fragments of DNA. So, these fragments of DNA can be added to the ELISA plate where you are coated the plate is coated with anti DNA antibody okay. and uh, when you add the another antibody which is specific for this uh, BRDU. So, it will come and bind and form a sandwich ELISA. Okay. I will explain in detail. So, DNA fragmentation ELISA. So, here we will be adding this BRDU to the cells. So, cells DNA will be labeled with this BRDU and when you treat this BRDU labeled cells with different concentration of nanoparticles. Okay. So, what will happen due to this nanoparticle treatment there will be a fragmentation of DNA into the cell that is your indication of apoptosis. So, we will be taking this ELISA plate okay, or 96 well plate and we will be coating this plate with uh, anti DNA antibody. So, your antibody will be coated on the plate. So, this DNA will be briefly treated with microwave. So, what happened due to this? This DNA will be open up and it will bind to this DNA and you will be adding another antibody which is specific for your BRDU okay. and it is having this enzyme label antibody. Okay. So, when you add the substrate, so this will produce the color formation. So, it is a sandwich ELISA, it is similar to the sandwich ELISA. Okay. So, here your uh, DNA is sandwiched between two antibodies and when you add the substrate there will be a formation of color. So, if you have more color formation that means it indicates that there is a more apoptotic induced by the particular nanoparticle. Okay. So, you can see here with the different concentration of nanoparticles treated to this and you can see here with the increasing concentration the amount of DNA fragmentation increase that means it is showing that uh, with the increasing concentration the apoptosis index is more. So, the next method is apoptotic DNA laddering and uh, here this is your uh, nucleosum core and this nucleosome is connected by the linker DNA and the distance between each nucleosome is 180 base pairs approximately. So, during this apoptosis the caspase will activate the endonuclease. So, this endonuclease enzyme will cut this nucleosome okay, at different sites randomly it will cut. So, due to that you will get the mono or oligonucleosomes. So, each uh, mononucleosome size is approximately 180 base pairs. Okay. So, here you will be getting the multiples of 180 base pairs. Okay. So, it, it can be uh, mononucleosome or it can be dinucleosome or it can be oligonucleosomes. So, here you will, will be having the multiples of 180 base pairs. When you run a gel and you will find this kind of ladder pattern. So, you can see here. So, this is your control genome where you are having only single band and this is a apoptotic DNA where you can see here a ladder formation this is called as DNA laddering. 
So, this Cas phase 3 enzyme will activate and it will lead to cleavage of chromosomal DNA okay, and this oligonucleosomal DNA fragment result in distinct laddering pattern. And also by using this uh, confocal laser scanning microscope, we can see here with, the with respect to concentration, the amount of cells is going down. And again, this MTT with respect to different concentration, the amount of cells is going down. And in case of DNA fragmentation ELISA, you can see here this apoptotic induction is more. So, this is correlating with your MTT data. So, next method is we can also use this uh, fax that is fluorescent activated cell sorting method to understand the apoptosis. So, in this you can use this cells. So, and the cells are labeled with various fluorescent markers and this detector will detect the cells according to the fluorescent signal. So, you can see here this red is going to here, yellow is going to here. So, we can easily sort out the cells based on the fluorescent labeling. So, using this uh, flow cytometer we can understand the apoptosis. So, this is here the sample is your cells. So, the cells can be labeled with uh, different kind of antibodies specific for apoptosis and necrosis. Okay. And this uh, fluorescent detector will detect your uh, cells according to the fluorescent signal and that can be plotted and analysis. Okay. So, here so the control cells will be in this channel and your uh, apoptotic cells will be here and the necrotic cells will be here. So, each apoptotic cells or necrotic cells will have a different kind of markers. So, we can label those markers with the fluorescent tag and by using the flow cytometer we can understand the apoptosis pathway. Okay. So, here the flow cytometry measures the light scattering properties of cells and fluorescent emissions of the molecules attached to the cells. Okay. So, let us see how we can use this flow cytometric analysis to understand the apoptosis. So, usually in the live cell in the plasma membrane you will be having phosphatidyl serine. So, this phosphatidyl serine will be facing towards this nucleus, but in case of apoptotic cells what will happen there will be a flip flop. So, due to that this phosphatidyl serine will be exposed to outside. Okay. So, when it exposed to outside we can make the antibody specific for that and this antibody can be labeled with fluorescence dye, green fluorescent dye. Okay. And in case of late apoptotic cells what happened due to this membrane perforation, so your uh, ethylene bromide or PI stain it can directly enter the nucleus and stain the nucleus into red color. So, here you are having green fluorescence in apoptotic cells and you are having red fluorescence in late apoptotic cells, red plus green. Okay. In case of necrotic there will not be any green color fluorescence, you will be having only red color fluorescence. So, when you do the flow cytometer, so the cells will be sorted according to the signals. Okay. To make it simplify I made this uh, boxes. Okay. So, your live cells will be here in this first box and the cells which is in the early apoptotic, so that is your uh, green fluorescent cells that will be captured in this and the late apoptotic cells where is the combination of green plus red. So, that will be captured here and the necrotic cells where you will be getting only the red color signal that will be captured here. Okay. So, based on the amount of the percentage you can see here the control one the percentage is only 17.7 that is the late apoptotic cells. In the treated one you can see here it is approximately 38.9 percentage. That means, with the treating with the nanoparticle the apoptotic percentage is increased. Okay. So, the another method to understand the toxic material is uh, we can use the ROS assay. So, in this ROS assay we will be using this DCFH DA. Okay. The, this is a non-fluorescent uh, dye and when you add it to the cells and uh, cellular esterase will convert this non-fluorescent into fluorescence. Okay. And in presence of reactive oxygen species this non-fluorescence DCFH will convert into DCF that is fluorescence. So, based on the fluorescence signal we will understand the amount of ROS production. So, here you will be using this uh, excitation at 495 and emission at 529 nanometer okay. and this uh, non-fluorescent population can be gated into R2 channel and uh, fluorescent cells can be in the R3. Okay. So, these are these uh, MCF7 cells and uh, A5 phonon cells, breast cancer, lung cancer cells. So, here this untreated cells will be taken into R2 channel that is your uh, non-fluorescent channel. Okay. And uh, with respect to different concentration, you can see here the fluorescent signal is increased. Okay. So, due to production of reactive oxygen species, so that will convert the non fluorescent uh, DCF DA into DCF fluorescence. So, you can see here with respect to concentration, this is your 50 percentage of your IC50 concentration. So, the here ROS production is 8.4 percentage, and when you use the IC50 concentration, the ROS production is 24.1. 
when we use the double the IC50 concentration, you can see here the ROS production also double. Okay. So using this simple assay, we can measure the reactive oxygen species production. And this is another data to show you the ROS estimation by DCFDA. And here you can see here, and at 20 hours time point, there is no fluorescence. Okay, the reactive oxygen species is produces less. Okay, and with the increasing in the time and increasing concentration, you can see here the fluorescence is more. That means the reactive oxygen species production is more. And we can also analyze the uh, fluctuation in the mitochondrial membrane potential. Okay, by using this rhodamine 1 to 3 stain, so which is also one of the indicator of apoptosis. So here the change in the mitochondrial membrane permeability with a loss in uh, mitochondrial membrane potential okay, is an indicator of early apoptotic events. And here we will be using this rhodamine 1 to 3 dye, it is a cationic dye which can rapidly diffuse inside the mitochondrial interior and it can reflect the changes in the mitochondrial membrane potential. <coughs> From A to C1 you can see here there is no loss of red fluorescence, okay. so these are untreated cells, so there is no loss of fluorescence. And here you can see here in D1 and E1, you can see here significant decline in the fluorescence. This is due to the loss of mitochondrial membrane potential. So, this research shows that uh, there is a remarkable decline in the mitochondrial membrane potential. So, which confirmed the induction of apoptosis by this drug loaded nano carrier. And uh, we can also do, uh, study the gene expression okay, by RT PCR that is your reverse transcriptase PCR okay. and uh, we can study the uh, expression of various genes. So, the beta actin is your internal control, this is a housekeeping gene okay. and uh, these are the various pro apoptotic genes and anti apoptotic genes. So, this BCL2 is your anti apoptotic gene. So, you can see here the down regulation of anti apoptotic genes. So, you can see here when compared to the untreated, so this one is the untreated, okay, the two is the treated one. So, when compared to the untreated, so, the expression of gene is going down, the band intensity is going down. So, these two are anti apoptotic genes and these are apoptotic genes. You can see here when compared to the control, so here the band intensity is more, that means the gene expression is more. Okay. So, these apoptotic genes expression is more and the anti apoptotic gene expression is down regulated. So, it confirms as it is inducing the, this particular nanopart is inducing the apoptotic pathway. Okay. So, it will be isolating the RNA from the cells, treated as well as control cells. So, this RNA will be converted into cDNA by enzyme called reverse transcriptase enzyme okay. and uh, this cDNA will be using this PCR and we will be amplifying it. Okay. So, this is called as semi quantitative PCR. So, when you amplify that control vessels treated okay, and you will be running a gel to understand the gene expression. For example, so this is your uh, caspase 3 gene okay, and this is your control sample, this is your treated. Okay. So, this is your DNA band, PCR band. So, in control you are seeing less amount of amplification, in the treated one you are seeing more amount of amplification. So, this shows that this caspase 3 expression is more, so which leads to induction of apoptosis. So, this gene expression intensity can be calculated using a software called image j. Okay. So, using this software you can calculate the intensity and you can plot the difference in the gene expression intensity when compared to control how much fold the gene expression is increased or decreased. Okay. So, based on the pro apoptotic and anti apoptotic genes we can make a schematic illustration of the events and uh, so in this example we are using this uh, AG zeno nanoparticles okay so it is binding to the cell membrane and it is inducing the reactive oxygen species the production of reactive oxygen species can be studied using dcfsda and uh, 
this ROS production will induce this P53, okay, and this P53 will induce the Bax bad genes. The, these are the pro apoptotic genes in the mitochondria, okay, and it will also down regulate the anti apoptotic genes like BCLXL and BCL2, okay, and uh, this pro apoptotic genes will induce this caspase 3. So, this caspase 3 will induce the uh, caspase 3 activated endonuclease, so that will fragment your uh, uh, genomic DNA into small, small fragments, okay. And all these events combine and induce the cellular apoptosis, okay. So, upon cellular uptake of these nanocomposites, which will induce the oxidative stress, okay, by inducing this reactor oxygen species, and it will trigger the P53 mediated apoptotic pathway, and which will lead to uh, induce the various uh, events, cascade of events like uh, mitochondrial membrane permeability, and also it will also changes the upregulation of various pro apoptotic genes, okay. So, which will leads to the execution of apoptotic pathway, okay. So, as a summary of this lecture, so in this lecture, uh, we have learnt what are the various methods available to study the uh, antibacterial as well as anti cancer properties of nanomaterials, okay. So, I will end my lecture here. I thank you all for listening to this lecture. I will see you all in another interesting lecture.